The following program is an original production of WYCC PBS Chicago. Tonight, vacant inner city lots and old warehouses are the newest Midwest farms. We'll take a look at the growing trend of urban farming. The second city stage has been a launch pad for comedians from John Belushi to Tina Fey. Now it is auditioning an even more diverse pool of talent. And then there were two, Pat Quinn and Bruce Rauner in the race for governor. What can voters expect in the eight months until Election Day? These stories and much more on In the Loop. Good evening, I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Tonight, a closer look at urban farming. In the past few years, dozens of urban farms and neighborhood gardens have sprouted up in and around Chicago. Some are producing bumper crops of fresh produce for communities that are often considered food deserts. We went down on the farm on Chicago's south side to see how things work at ground level. I would have to say this place means the world because we're trying to help feed the world. Meet 22-year-old Tyrus Walker, a new breed of farmer, growing acres of spinach, carrots, tomatoes, and berries in the shadow of manufacturing plants and interstate highways. The nonprofit Growing Power runs the Iron Street Farm where he works. Its mission? Providing easy access to healthy food in communities where fresh produce is hard to find. Tyrus is also cultivating a new generation of urban farmers, teens from the city's Youth Corps program. I feel like if it wasn't here, I'd be... I'd be dead or I'd be in jail. 21-year-old Devon J. Wallace, farming turned his life around. Before growing power, he was sowing trouble, running with the wrong crowd, robbing people and selling drugs. This keep me out of a lot of trouble, man, a whole lot of trouble. So I, I'm, I like being here. Devon J. is one of dozens of young people learning urban farming on this two-acre plot of land surrounded by concrete and blight. Iron Street is just one of a growing number of urban farms taking root in and around Chicago. I think we need to have urban farms because food is a human right. Because people need to be able to know where their food comes from, have control and sovereignty over it, and be active participants in their own destiny. Erica Allen is the Chicago and National Projects Director for Growing Power. Her father, Will Allen, started the organization more than 20 years ago in Milwaukee. Now, Growing Power has 15 urban farmer training centers across the U.S. We eat three times a day. So the fact that we have no investment in our food growing infrastructure, that is, uh, is this sustainable? Well, it sure better be. Growing Power sells fresh produce to several area restaurants, to Walgreens, and Chicago Public Schools bought 30,000 pounds of their carrots last fall. Another customer, the green grocer on Grand Avenue. We know that when we put in an order, it's going to be picked that day. So rather than having something shipped in and being on a truck or a train from Mexico and not having any idea of who, who's behind it or how long it's been there. In 2012, Mayor Emanuel announced the formation of an urban farm district on the city's south side. There are currently 15,000 vacant lots owned by the city of Chicago, each one of them a potential urban farm. I don't think it's just a fad, something that provides jobs and provides training. And urban farming is growing in the most unlikely places. Farmed Here LLC opened this 90,000 square foot growing center in suburban Bedford Park last year, the largest indoor farm in the country. Without sunshine or dirt, indoor farmers grow organic lettuces and herbs sold in places like Whole Foods. The plants take root in water under fluorescent lights. Giant tanks of tilapia, also farmed here, provide the fertilizer. With higher fuel prices driving up the cost of transporting food and population growth in inner cities, the number of urban farms is expected to rise. But in 2050, 70% of uh, world population will live in urban areas. So I'm like, you know, we need something local, we need something fresh, we need something good. Back at Iron Street Farm, they're getting ready for the spring planting season. Soon, the fields will be teeming with young volunteers, taking new pride in the old career of farming. 
I, my family actually feel good about me doing this because I done actually got some of my uh, siblings involved and I've kind of brought friends from the neighborhood and they kind of got involved with it. So my family kind of proud of me. <laughs> so yeah. Today we're joined by Tim Murakami, Urban Farms Manager for Growing Home Incorporated, a different organization that was profiled in the piece. We'll talk about your program in a moment. But Tim, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. The idea of producing organic food in the concrete jungle seems counterintuitive almost. Sure, yeah. Growing Home was one of the um, first urban farms that was certified organic, actually. So we are USDA certified organic, and um, so all of our product is grown in accordance with uh, very strict standards. In the inner city? Right. On, uh, actually, in uh, the southwest side, in the Englewood neighborhood, as well as in the back of the yards neighborhood. How much food? We've seen some of these urban gardens, and obviously we saw the larger facility out in Bedford Park, but how much food can be produced in some of these small places in urban gardens? Um, sure, I can just speak to our operation. Um, we have three farm sites, and the total growing space of those sites is about an, an acre and a half. And <clears throat> last year, we produced about 24,000 pounds of produce, um, and we hadn't even, uh, we're not even at full capacity yet. Oh, wow, so that's pretty significant yield for an inner city farm in a small space. Talk about the finances of something like this. With such a small space, can you make enough money to stay afloat? It is possible, although um, I think what you'll find as you kind of get into the world of urban agriculture is that uh, all of these different projects have different missions. And so um, uh, an organization like Farm Tier, which is profiled in your piece, um, they're a for-profit business. And then you'll also find other kinds of operations like um, nonprofits that have other pieces to their mission as well. So um, Growing Home, um, we are a nonprofit, um, but we are a social enterprise, so we, we do uh, earn income that supports our operations. Um, but we also have a pieces to what we do, um, like our job training program, as well as the produce that we sell in, in the neighborhood where we're located. Um, that, uh, you wouldn't necessarily do if you were just trying to paying attention to the bottom line. So your program is more, is some about getting fresh food into food deserts in neighborhoods where there is no, is no place to buy fresh produce, but more about jobs. That's correct, yes. Our, our primary mission is to um, operate our transitional employment program. So, you know, our, our goal is to prepare people for unsubsidized good living wage jobs when they graduate our job training program. How does farming do that? Farming is actually an excellent way to do that because there's, there's really no better place than a working, productive, deadline-driven, intense um, working farm to prepare people for the sorts of jobs that they move on to after our program. So um, typical jobs that um, graduates get after growing home are food-related businesses. So that might be in a kitchen or in a food distribution um, warehouse, or even actually in businesses like Farm Tier. We have a graduate working there right now. So um, all of these sorts of employment situations are you know, fast pace, um, you know, production places. So a farm is a perfect place to prepare people for jobs. Wow, at first glance, you wouldn't think of farming as a high, high stress deadline business. But some of these farms are designed to produce high quality designer greens and herbs but also to uh, feed people in underserved communities. How do you balance the finances of that? Uh, isn't it much more lucrative to sell a $10 bunch of arugula than to distribute it in a community that is underserved? Sure, yeah, and, and our Growing Home walks that line. Um, we, we do both, and so we, we provide our, we make our produce available in the Englewood neighborhood um, at a discounted price than our other sales outlets. Um, we sell at farmers markets and through a community supported agriculture program. Um, and so, you know, it's all about just defining your priorities. And so for us, it's important that our produce is, is available in the community where, we, where it's grown, um, in addition to, to the need to earn an income from this produce. Talk about, I mean, we're in Chicago, clearly the growing season is limited. I mean, how profitable can you be growing outdoors in a climate like this? Sure, um, so growing home, there are various uh, growing techniques that you can use uh, to extend the growing season in a climate like Chicago. And so that can range anywhere from, 
you know, full indoor production with, you know, grow lights and heat. Um, but what we've done is we've extended our season. So we use unheated, um, green, unheated high tunnels, they're called, and that allows us to grow um, 10 months out of the year. So it's, there's a range of options that you have. All right, Tim Markama, we'll leave it there. Nice to meet you and learn a little bit about urban farming. Now in other trending stories, winners of this week's gubernatorial primaries are already off to the races. Some big concerns over celebrities deciding not to vaccinate their children and cigarettes could soon be tougher to find. The pollsters predicted a landslide, but Republican Bruce Rauner just squeaked by in the primary race to face Governor Quinn in November. Thank you for your patriotism. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for your hard work. It's an honor for Evelyn and I. We are excited to go to work for you and every voter in this state. Let's shake up Springfield. Let's go get them. Tonight, the people of Illinois have spoken, and I am honored to accept their nomination to be the governor of Illinois. Chicago Bears quarterback Jay Cutler and his wife are joining other celebrities who are saying no to vaccination. They fear a link to autism that scientists say does not exist. I got vaccinations in, in 1967. I don't have autism. I mean, I think, I think it's healthy to do it. First, CVS Pharmacy cleared the shelves of cigarettes. Now more states, including Illinois, are pressuring supermarket operators like Kroger and Safeway to stop selling tobacco products. I, I don't purchase tobacco products, but um, it seems kind of ridiculous. I smoke and I'm, I'm just trying to stop smoking. And if, if we don't have no place to buy the cigarettes, maybe we all will stop. Another chapter is coming to an end for Oprah and her ties to Chicago. For more than 20 years, the Oprah Winfrey Show was taped at Chicago's Harpo Studios. Now the building is being sold. I don't think she should have sold it. And now here in our studio, our guest today, William Natale, Executive Director for the Illinois Center for Broadcasting, Lisa Druss Christman, consultant with Seraphin and Associates, and Ivy Walker, CEO of Helios Digital Learning. Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you, Chris. So the pollster said it was going to be a landslide, and yet Bruce Rauner barely uh, squeaked by. Uh, is this a lesson for the media here that maybe we shouldn't pay so much attention to these polls, Ivy? I think a couple of things um, ha are occurring. First, I think um, there was some Democratic crossover to try to help Kirk out to make Kirk the, Kirk the Dillard. Uh, Kirk, yeah, um, yeah, to make uh, Dillard. I'm sorry, the uh, the candidate uh, for the Republican ticket, and um, that so that helped to bolster his numbers. But on the other hand, absolutely, I, I think calling these elections so far in advance and it's going to be a landslide just proves to be time and time again is incorrect. And I think the races tend to tighten as we get closer, as people start to make their decisions, because even with his lead, um, there was still a large gap of undecideds um, in that in that race, even with Rounder's lead. So, um, so I think as you continue to watch these races get closer to election day, you start to see that. Kind and the turnout was incredibly low, record low turnout in this area. And Lisa, do you think part of that was the negative ads that we saw so many of? Well, let's talk about the ads for a second because this is going to be an unprecedented election in this state. Rauner outspent Senator Diller 16 times. Think about the money that's going to be pumped into these advertisements and t for television stations They're and radio stations. They're already starting. Union money <laughs> is going to go flowing into Quinn's coffers. He already has eight, nine million dollars raised already. Seven hundred and fifty million dollars was given by the uh, gubernatorial. Uh, campaign yesterday to Rauner. TV stations are going to, and radio stations, are they going to start getting an influx of complaints from their viewers and listeners because of so many ads that are being placed? And what are TV stations going to do? Turn around this good money that they've never well, seen the, like this the before? Well, the TV stations aren't going to complain about the money. I can guarantee you But that. this is going to be unprecedented as far as money spent in advertising and money spent in a campaign, and it's going to be a really huge race. We're already seeing, uh, William, the outlines of the campaign, and it really looks like class warfare. I mean, Governor Quinn is already talking about a rounders, nine homes, and the billionaire. Are we going to see this narrative, do you think, for the next few months until the election? Oh, yeah. I think this will be the strategy without question. Uh, I think Pat Quinn, who's been a uh, public servant, so to say, uh, even with his experience with Cub, uh, and people see him that way, even prior to his role yeah, as an, uh, an elected official, are, he's going to use that. That's going to continue to be used. Bruce Rauner, even today, uh, was on, I believe, NPR, talking about <clears throat> how uh, the working man needs to be addressed. And so he's going to soften up his message. And if I can just add one thing on the Kirk Dillard thing, because Senator 
Kirk Dillard is uh, the senator of record at one of our campuses at the Illinois Center for Broadcasting in Lombard. And what's disappointing, at least for his campaign, because this is the second time he's, you know, been up, is that 24,000 people uh, voted for Bruce Rauner in DuPage County more so than for him. And that's really got to be disappointing because DuPage is where he's from, you know, that's his uh, center of gravity. But Dillard also won downstate, yeah. and Rauner did not. That's true. And that's going to show a lot in the election because Quinn is one heck of a campaigner, and you cannot count him out. And last election, he won by one, less than one percent, I think it was. But this is, you know, you're having a first-time candidate, Bruce Rauner. He's already taking the word union out of his dialogue. He's going right. to stay away from that now. And, and you've got Quinn, who's going to be hitting the pavement and hitting the pavement and hitting the pavement, and you can't count him out. It looks like Quinn and the Democrats are going to try their best to turn Bruce Rauner into Mitt Romney. Is right. that an effective strategy? I think in the state of Illinois, um, the citizenry is more and more aware of where we are fiscally. And I think painting Rauner as an out-of-touch billionaire as, as he, he said, oh, I'm probably 0.1%, you know, um, that does a lot to put him in that Mitt Romney camp, that he doesn't understand the struggles in this state. And I think it could be a very effective strategy. Um, you know, on the other hand, Rounder's got to point to what has been accomplished over the last six he's, years. He's of painting it. Quinn as a failure. Exactly. And, and, and I know a lot of people who voted for Rounder just because he has never held public office. Right? And Rounder also has made it a point, I know because he's used our studios to record something, he's made it a point to say, I flipped burgers and I uh, worked in car washes. And his so. grandparents lived in a double Y. Right. Although and his, also he his, said, his, his father was a lawyer. And he's also said, excuse me for being successful, what's wrong with working hard and building what, your own fortune? Right. Yeah, and, and I think I think there are two sides to that issue. I think, you know, there's the whole class warfare and, and um, there's this anger against self-made people. And I, I think that's really only a part of the story. I think the other part of the story is, yeah, you may have come from humble beginnings, but the question is, do you remember what it was like in that beginning? because those people who are still struggling to make their way if you can't relate to some of the social issues that they face if you can't relate to some of the economic issues that they face then it doesn't matter that you started there right. because you're too far removed from it now and so that's kind of one of my concerns I've got nothing against self-made people but when you think about um, the, the social fabric that connects all of us when you think about how the lower rung can make it to the middle and the upper rung that social fabric is critical it's going to be it's going to be Point bruising, well and we know Illinois is a contact sport when it comes to politics. We want to turn to the real sports world. Chicago Bears uh, quarterback uh, and his wife, Kristen Cavallari. Kristen has come out and said that she's not going to vaccinate their uh, new child. Um, and some physicians are worried about the sway that celebrities have when they suggest that vaccination is not a good idea for fear of autism because the scientists are saying, the CDC is saying, that there is no evidence connecting vaccines to, to autism. Well, you know what the vehicle of this is, is social media. And Kristen Cavallari, is, she is a reality star and she is a self-proclaimed Twitter, she's on Twitter all the time. And, you know, in our age, we don't need to go look for the news, the news finds us. And even if you or you or I don't follow Kristen Cavallari, we're going to hear about that story because it's out on social media and it's going to come to us from another source, from an ABC, from a CNN, whatever it is, because it's become a story. And yes, the celebrity status raises it. So regardless of whether you think it's right or wrong and what she believes in, it's an issue just because of social media. But Ivy, does it have real life consequences? It absolutely has real life consequences. When, you know, I as a parent choose not to vaccinate my child, I'm making a decision for others around me as well. We are a community and, and there's a reason why vaccinations were introduced to help control the spread of communicable diseases. Now that said, you know, Kristen Cavallari is a mom and um, she doesn't know all the backstory behind all the research, but she knows what she has seen so far. And I think what she and Jenny McCarthy and others who raise this issue are really pointing to the real underlying issue is a lack of trust in the system. It's a talk? lack of belief in the fact right. that um, there are studies that say there's no link, but who funded those studies? Where do they come from and why do I trust them? And if you talk to people at SASID or ISTAC that deal with autism, and uh, in particular, uh, one, one woman I know, Michaeline Romano, who deals with it, you, you, you know from talking with them about the real stories, uh, a 26-year-old son, for example, that she has, who was vaccinated perfectly fine up until the vaccination, and after that now That's has an anecdotal you know, piece, though. I mean, the CDC has come out 
very forcefully and said there is no scientific link between vaccination yeah, one and one out autism. of 88 young men have Asperger's? One out of, one out of 88 uh, individuals in this country uh, has autism according to the And CDC. the majority of it is male. And, and what's right. happening is our young males, you know, in great numbers are, you know, uh, either autism or Asperger's, which is a form of autism. So, you know, how can you question a mother who says, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to take that chance. And they'll tell you that there's less mercury, but how do we really know that? Well, you, you question the mother because maybe she's getting more influence in the media because she's a celebrity than the scientists. It's absolutely true. But, you know, again, I'm not, again, I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm not defending her. But if this is what she wants to do, you know, every person has their right. Yes, there are facts out there, but she's not a medical doctor. We are not medical doctors. The CDC is are full of experts. But think about it, 20 years ago, did we really know autism and the spectrum and Asperger's and everything else? This is a, a, a situation now that is being magnified. And what's going to happen in another 20 years? What are we going to know about more that we didn't know about now? So it's evolution. And part of the evolution is people changing their mind about medical practices. And I mean, does the news also... media have to do a better job of um, not making this so relative, in other words, giving? Uh, a Jenny Absolutely. McCarthy equal billing with a scientist? Absolutely, because at the end of the day, Jenny McCarthy is far more attractive and far more interesting than the scientists who say, yeah, but the studies say something otherwise. And so there is this natural pull to celebrity culture that we have. It's why we have reality television it's shows. It's, why we... it's on a personal level for her. She has a son that it's has it. Absolutely, yeah. it's a personal level. And it goes back to a, tr a lack of trust in the system. Do you trust the CDC? Oh, and no. the answer appears to be no for yeah. her. And it appears to be no for a growing number of individuals and the question becomes is there real reason to feel that way why do people eat organic food did they trust the system before we organic food is relatively new except as ivy world. pointed out this has real consequences in that we're seeing now a spike in, in diseases such as measles and, and whooping cough the fact of the matter is that the only way you can keep some of these vaccinations uh, current or uh, up to date is with with a certain amount of mercury in them that that's a fact and i know that from my brother who's a cardiovascular surgeon who went to Haiti and was dealing with all sorts of vaccinations and told me the mercury level is just as high as it's ever been. So the CDC can tell you all they want that the mercury you're level not, you're is not, I, I get it. You're not going to quite believe them. No. Let's move on to <laughs> another not. public health issue, which is tobacco and uh, smoking. The Illinois Attorney General, Lisa Madigan, has joined other attorneys general in asking the supermarkets and places like Walmart to stop selling tobacco products in the wake of CVS deciding to do it. Ivy, is that good public health or is it big, big government getting in the way? You know, I, I think it's good public health. And I say bravo to CVS for making the decision that it's incompatible with their mission as building themselves as a health care center to also push tobacco. You'll never walk into your doctor's office and see cigarettes offered for sale. And so I, I, I think that as we continue, we've learned a lot about the effects of tobacco, about its hold on people. And I think, yeah, I think it, it's, it's, there's a public health, there's a public service good that is being done by putting pressure on um, reducing the availability of tobacco. Now, you know, we've seen in cities like San Francisco and Boston, they've already banned retail pharmacies from selling But it's tobacco. a legal product. It's a legal product, but we have to look at the flip side of this. Do you know what the tobacco industry means to the economy in the United States? 3.8 million jobs from the U uh, United States Drug Administration, I found that. And in 2011, $8.3 billion was spent in advertising by tobacco companies in our economy. If you force these companies out of business, what happens to those jobs, those dollars in our economy? I'm not condoning smoking. I'm just saying you have to look at the flip side. In our Thank country, you. unemployment is always prevalent in topics. And we have to look at the job creation in, this, in the economy that's pumped in there. But you won't force them out of business because they've got Europe and they've got China and they've got plenty of other markets in which they're selling cigarettes without question. I mean, uh, huge uh, volumes of you know, cartons of cigarettes are being shipped overseas. The fact of the matter is, uh, kudos to Lisa Madigan for taking the initiative with the other attorneys generals and, and saying, you know what, this is not, this is not a, a good product for health. You're, you're putting off a health image where, remember, a lot of your vaccinations now are being done at CVS and Walgreens. If they want to be a health advocate, how can they carry cigarettes? We just have a few seconds left. Very quickly, Oprah leaving for good, I guess. She's selling her building. Should we care, Ivy? 
Well, it made me personally very sad. I remember when Oprah showed up on television and the first time I ever saw it, it made a really big impression on me. And so when I heard that she was selling Harpo, I kind of felt like we that final tie was cut. And it, I think it's a really big loss for the city of Chicago. All right, so long, <laughs> Oprah, for good. <laughs> thank you so much. William Detali, Lissa Dross Christman, and Ivy Walker, thank you. Bob Curry was the first African-American to perform at the legendary Second City Improv Comedy Theater. In his honor, the theater has rolled out something special for minority performers. Keep more poison around the house. We gotta keep our children strong. On this stage is where it all began for so many top comedians. Dan Aykroyd, Tina Fey, Harold Ramis, Mike Myers, all honed their comedy chops right here. Over the years, Second City has become world famous for mentoring some of the world's best comedians and sketch artists. For more than 50 years, the Improv Comedy Theater has served as a farm team for bigger venues, particularly NBC's Saturday Night Live. And now that SNL has been stung by criticism that its cast lacks diversity, Second City is working to change that. The organization is giving minority performers the chance of a lifetime with a new fellowship program. We thought this would be a great way to identify more talent, open our doors, and create this work to make it more accessible, more accessible to talent getting involved in sketch comedy. <laughs> Is there is no shortage of actors looking to tap into what Second City is offering. We held a Chicago audition. We had over 145 submissions. And in our day-long audition, we saw about 85 candidates comprised of classic, classic, uh, classical trained actors along with improvisation. Two of the chosen fellows who ultimately beat out 140 other applicants got their starts at an early age. When I was a little kid, I was the kid that would run up to p my parents' friends at dinner parties and say, look what I can do, and then sing Aretha Franklin songs start to finish. I grew up around like uh, musicals and like in the church and stuff like that, so I always had like a performance uh, sort of background. Now the two aspiring performers get their shot to showcase their talents on the Second City stage. I'm very excited that we're in a position where we have access to a lot of awesome teachers and we'll get to speak to the directors here at Second City and producers. I am so, so, so excited uh, and grateful to Second City for the opportunity. Um, I've kind of been paying attention to the uh, outreach and diversity program for a while. Torian and Ali represent the huge talent pool in Chicago that sometimes misses out on major opportunities such as Second City. We know the talent is out there. We know that Chicago is a rich, rich theater community and uh, that is ripe with talent, particularly diverse talent and talent of color. If given the opportunity to show up and to perform on stage and to give, if given that slot, they would show up in droves. The eight-week Bob Curry Fellowship begins March 24th and good luck to the recipients. Well, that concludes this week's show. You are now in the loop. Join us online right now for the after show. Our guests will weigh in on the frantic last minute ad campaign for Obamacare. Until next week, I'm Chris Bury. And I'm Barbara Pinto. Good night. <laughs>